As you guys may have heard just a few moments ago, this is a talk about how we build engaged communities. I think I gave it the title participatory communities when I was writing it out in the book. I changed it. It's not as easy to share on social media when you use participatory. So we're talking about getting people to participate. This comes out of my deep love for both social media, which if you haven't guessed, I'm a huge advocate for it, but also public relations. So PR is about building mutually beneficial relationships. My background is with Christian apologetics. That's what my master's is in. And I did that out of a heart to help bridge the gap that seems to be there between ministries and culture. And then I recognize that we have a lot of amazing ministries happening, but we seem to not be able to build that relationship all the time. So I studied public relations, particularly in digital credibility. How are we credible organizations to build relationships with people who are unlike ourselves? I ended up doing a national study looking at how we create engagement, what people expect from us when we are not an individual on social media, but we're an organization. And so as we talk today, I would encourage you to think of yourself as a brand, which is really hard. When I do my private consulting, a lot of people say, we are not a brand, we are a ministry, or I'm a church, but you are an organizational presence. You're not an individual. And so when we think of that, when people think of the name of your church, when they think of the name of your ministry, in their mind, they've come up with a brand. They've come up with some idea of who you are. And we talk a lot about brand personas. So are you friendly? Are you serious? Are you humorous? Are you quirky? Are you intriguing? There, there's these concepts that we have. And we bring that to full weight within social media because social media has a unique platform. It was originally designed for one-to-one, -one, friend to friend engagement, and now we are organizations engaging there. So that's a bit about where we're headed. Today's conversation is not on creating a strong social media plan or policy or any of those other things that I think are really important. It's really zeroing in on how do we build engagement. Before we do that, I want to give you just a lay of the land. It's a video that I find they update it every year, so I always look for it, so it gives me the latest. It has not the most amazing background music to listen for to for two minutes, so I'm sorry, but it's a quick snapshot of the social media landscape that I think gives us the background for this conversation today. Okay, so that was way easier than me putting slide after slide of information about how much our culture has adopted technology. And I, one of my favorite things that they say in these videos is it's not social media and technology that are merging. They are or not emerging, they're merging, they're here. It's something we're dealing with. And a lot of times when I talk with organizations, they say, well, no one's talking about our brand. We're not even on social media. Or we are on social media and we're not getting engagement, and so we know people aren't talking about us. But the thing is, we have powerful ways to address the world's issues today. We are talking about relevant topics in our churches and in our ministries, and those are the conversations we're trying to ignite. Those are the conversations we're trying to join. So to give you a lay of the land, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the social media landscape in the context of why it is that people might not be responding on social media to ministries and what empowers people to want to respond. Then we're gonna talk about ministry digital communities because we're keeping this on social media. So how do we make these communities engaged with us as a ministry, not just engaged using social media while we're trying to do a sermon or while we're trying to send out information about what our latest fundraising campaign is. And then we're gonna look at a few ways that these could be applied. I was very interested in who would come to this session today because whoever's here will change the course of the conversation we're having. So I'll try to give some ways that it can apply to ministries, but it'll be you talking about who your ministry is and how it can connect. So we're gonna do that throughout the day. So those are our three points. Before we continue, I'm about PR. I would love for you guys to just meet the people around you, share a little bit about, are you from a ministry? Are you from a church? Are you from a school? Why are you here? What are you hoping to gain from this? So go ahead and take 30 seconds just to talk to someone you may not have met yet. So this is just a real world example of what we actually want to accomplish. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring us all back. Slowly but surely, this is good. We have people who want to engage. What just happened right now is what you want to do on your social media platforms. You want to start conversations. I didn't sit up here and say, now you tell me something and you tell me something and I'll tell you something. I said, let's talk, let's have a conversation. And it was really hard to keep it to 30 seconds. In fact, we didn't. So that's the goal. It's not making social media this abstract thing that doesn't relate to how we interact in real life. It's mirroring what we do. It's building conversations, not just among us, but among the people who are related to a conversation. 
So I like to think of this as a social principle. When we're talking about the landscape of social media, when we're talking about why something is working or not working, I think it generally goes back to our understanding of the social principle, which is the fluid nature of social media is designed for and sustained in relationship through two-way communication around topics of mutual interest that is user-generated, created, and driven. This should be a guiding philosophy in how we do social media. So I'm going to break this down. The fluid nature of social media is something organizations were struggling with at the early days. Some of us still do, but it's the idea that it's unscripted, undesigned communication. People get to say what they want on social media. You can't control it. You can't censor it. And oftentimes, the best conversations are the ones that happen organically. They just come out of nowhere. Those are the ones we want. It's the fluid nature of social media, and that's one of the reasons why it's so powerful. It connects with a ton of people. In the video, it said it's no longer word of mouth. It's world of mouth, because a message can spread in seconds across the globe. It is sustained in relationship. When your organization fails to understand that social media was originally designed to bridge friends, to bridge connections, when it's no longer about a relationship, when it's about pushing information, you've lost the main principle. And it makes a lot of sense why people would stop interacting with you. Because people go to social media sites because they have a relationship with someone. The relationship component is why it's really important for you to understand the persona of your brand, the persona of your ministry, the persona of your church because it's going to dictate how you communicate. Are you going to be engaging in a caring way? Are you doing a lot of information based? Who are you? Because you have to have a relationship with people. In the social media world, they don't get to walk into a building and feel what it's like by being around a bunch of people who are involved in your organization, who are leading your organization. They go to Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or Instagram or YouTube or any number of other platforms and they look at who you are based on what's happening there to understand your persona. Two-way communication is that it's supposed to go both ways. So a lot of times we talk about the fact that about 70% of brands don't respond at all on social media, even to kind things. You should respond either way, but there's 70% of things left unresponded to. And people actually expect, I think it's about 40% of people expect a response within 60 minutes. Maybe a little unrealistic, but that's what they're expecting. So when I go in to consult with ministries and churches and they say, hey, we're not getting connection, one of the first things I look for is not why aren't people responding back to you, but how are you building two-way communication? Are you interacting or are you just posting? Have you talked to anyone? Have you liked anything? And then the goal is that it's topics of mutual interest that is user generated. You need to know who your community is. You need to know who the people are because they're the ones that are going to drive this conversation. You can't dictate the conversation in social media. And oftentimes, that's what's killing conversations, is organizations saying, this is what we're talking about. This is all we're talking about. Why is no one joining us? We wouldn't do that in a conversation with someone. We shouldn't do it in social media. This is an older infographic. I was really trying to find their latest one. They also do it yearly. I could tell it was old because Instagram is actually the second most popular now. It overtook Twitter last year. But what I encourage people to do is when you are planning to get on social media, know the platform you're on. Today is not about dissecting every platform and their number of users, the best time to post, all of those things. Those come into your social media strategy. It should be considered. But what I do want to illustrate is that it's not hard to find that information. Every quarter, I Google social media statistics 2015, and I'll look at the most recent one so I can see the latest. That's a great way to stay up to date. It takes about half an hour, and it lets you know who your publics are. Oftentimes, you'll get interesting things that you may not have realized, such as, did you know that seniors were the fastest growing population on Twitter? Last year, it was the fastest growing population on Facebook. So if your policy is still approaching Facebook as that fastest growing population, are you missing something? Things like that. So from there, that's the social landscape. The social principle is building those engagements, is realizing that it's two-way, it's based in a relationship, it's unscripted, and the best content is user-generated, created, and sustained. That's the social media principle and landscape. So now we're going to talk about your virtual tribes. Anyone read Seth Godin? Oh, OK. That, good, good. <laughs> There's a few of us in here. You should read Seth Godin's Tribes. And he is a popular blogger. He writes a lot. But his concept is that we are made for communities. We naturally gravitate towards communities. And he calls these communities tribes. But now we are no longer bound by a geographic tribe. It's not just, hey, who's around me physically or who's my family unit. We have non-geographically bound tribes. Because we can create our groups 
in a digital network. So it doesn't matter if you're in a different time zone. It doesn't matter if you're in a different country. It's around our topics of interest, our mutual interest, which is perfect because that builds conversation. When you recognize that your people are built on their interests, it changes your approach to content generation. It changes your approach to conversations. Even <coughs> saying content generation makes it sound like you're just throwing information out there. That's not the goal. The goal is to recognize what matters to your community and your people. So we're going to talk a little bit about how do you identify your tribes? How do you figure out who you should be talking to? Oftentimes, I think we're a little too simplistic in our approach. We say, well, we have our Facebook users, our Twitter users, our Instagram users, and here's the latest statistics. That's just demographics. That's not really telling you your tribe. And that's not acknowledging that there's multiple tribes probably within your community on Facebook or on Twitter or on Snapchat. We're just going to presume that every time I say social media, I mean social media. So what you're looking for is natural groupings around an interest. What things is your ministry or church about? What interests have drawn people in? I was talking with a dear friend recently about the different ethos of churches and how some of them are really designed around communities that are hurting and fostering an environment where they're comfortable. Others are around the pursuit of diversity in the body of Christ. Others seem to be around the pursuit of engaging culture in unique ways. So there's different cultures to every church. There's different focuses to every ministry. Your goal is not to say, what's our brand? Like, what's our name? What's the CEO's name? What's the president's name? What's the pastor's name? Those are helpful keywords eventually. But what you're asking is, what's the general topic that we're about? And is this what our community is about? Sometimes you'll find a huge disconnect between what the church or the ministry is about and the people who are on their social media channels. And it makes you wonder, how did these people come here? What were they expecting? Your goal is to figure out that natural interest. Sometimes people are grouping together because of an event or activity. Last night, I was like a mad person on Twitter, redoing the hashtag, adding people who have been part of the hashtag for this event, because this event created a tribe. This event drew people together in a way that hasn't happened before. A lot of you I would not have met without this. So perhaps you have events as part of your ministry or your church, or maybe you have activities. There, my church just did a hike on Saturday, and you could tell the people who were joined together because they wanted to hike. I was in bed, but I'm sure they made a great tribe. And then you might consider segmentation on those demographics. So we've talked about things like male and female. Those are easier to hit. But what about membership? Do you have any people who are ambassadors for your ministry or your program? Do you have a special group of donors that seem very active? Are you trying to reach moms with certain age groups? Maybe you have different offerings in different regions, or maybe you're really interested in reaching influencers, the leaders of your small groups, or the people who are gonna be volunteering for your organization. Whatever it is, those become your tribes. So I'm going to talk about some potential publics. And what we found with a lot of the research that's been done into social media, there's a lot of things that make people interested. But some of the top are that people want entertainment. That's why they go to social media. In the study, I found that was almost the number one reason why people end up on social media. They're bored. They want entertainment. Another is that they want information. They don't want to be advertised to, though. They don't want to be publicized to. They want information that makes them an information source and informs them on information they need for life decisions, for actions they're going to take. And then a lot of people are looking for connection. One of the things I usually have to make a case for anytime I talk social media, and I'm really glad, I feel like we're the same kind of people here, so I'm not going to make this case. But I have to argue vehemently that genuine connection can happen through social media, that people are authentic, that relationships are built. There seems to be an idea that if something happens in the virtual world, it's less real, less valuable because it happened virtually. And there are so many stories, statistics, facts, anecdotes, and quotes, every kind of information piece I could throw at you that says connections that happen in social media are real. They make a difference. There are people whose lives are changed because of social media. So we see that people are looking for entertainment, information, or connection. Because I'm trying to keep us all engaged and trying to share and learn from each other, I would love for you guys to, again, just talk to the people around you who are maybe your top two or three tribes, not platforms. Who are the people that your organization is reaching through social media? Who are your tribes?
right, we're going to bring it back in again. I'm curious, who are some of the tribes that you guys just identified? Who's important to your organization? <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to rethink my 30-second strategy here. Okay, so who's important to your ministry or your church? Who are your tribes? Anyone want to volunteer? No one's going to steal your tribe, I promise. <laughs> yeah. Home educators. Home educators, yeah, good. Pastors. Pastors, yeah. Alumni and parents. Alumni and parents. Donors and prayer partners. Yeah, donors and prayer partners. So we're seeing that it's really unique how people identify their tribes because it can be based on the need of what that group or tribe needs. It can be based on the interest of what drives that tribe. It could be based on a profession. I'm gonna walk you through three examples that are pretty general. Some questions that you'll wanna ask for each tribe. So a very common thing I hear from people is that they're using social media to engage with new or potentially new community members. And that could be within any given tribe that you have. Maybe you want to attract more leaders. Maybe you want to attract more home educators. Maybe you want to attract more pastors. But your goal is to, to engage these new members. There was a great study that was done on how your current members actually do a better job at introducing new members into your community on social media than you could do as the organization itself. And so your goal is to foster the kind of community where people are behaving in such a way that once a new member comes, they know exactly how to plug in. They know exactly how to engage. But new members, that could be one. One I hear all the time is we want to attract the young people. Um, that's great, I think that's a really good goal. I don't think that's specific enough, and that's often the problem, is young people use social media, so so do we. Well, yeah, but so does every other generation. Why are you trying to reach young people specifically? What kind of young people? What's motivating them? Which platform do you think is best to meet that need? These are questions you need to ask. Just because a certain tribe is using social media doesn't mean it's the right solution for you. Doesn't mean it's the place that you'll be able to build conversations. You have to figure out what your tribe is. So if you're a little broad in your tribes, you might want to specific it out. Specific it out, that's great. You might want to make it a little more specific. You might have influencers. This is a big one, and it, it's a little tricky. So you might be wanting to engage with major donors. You might be wanting to engage with the decision makers. You might want to get to the people who will make it so other people decide to join your community, volunteer in your community, purchase something from your community. And there's different ways that you would approach those influencers. So what you're seeing is that you can no longer identify your tribes by platform. You need to identify them based on the relationship with your organization and a couple other factors. Sorry for so much text. Questions to consider. You make a list of tribes. That's what I would strongly encourage you to do. Make a list of your tribes and try to be as specific as possible for your ministry or your church. And then ask these questions. What are the common values, opinions, beliefs, behaviors that link the people in this audience? So when you say we want to engage millennials, that's a pretty big audience. What kind of millennials? Why? How? What's making them your tribe? What draws them together? If you're wanting influencers, is it because they have positions of influence over other people and you believe that if they were aware of what your organization, church, or ministry is doing, they would also use their influence to come alongside it? What makes them a common group? And then what information or content would be most meaningful to the people in this audience? We usually skip this question. We jump from who do I need to how do I make them do what I want them to do? It's a wrong question for social media. It's kind of the wrong question in general, but Definitely for social media because you go back to that social principle. It's about a relationship and it's two-way communication and it's sustained through user-generated content. So your first question after identifying your tribes and what links them is what do these people need from us? What are they looking for? What motivates them? What inspires them? If you're thinking through three of the primary reasons people use social media, what's entertaining to them? What is the information they need? And what provides a connection? What makes a meaningful tribe for them? What makes them feel like they're part of this tribe? And then ask what your ministry hopes to accomplish as a result of this interaction. So you know who your tribe is, you know what they're looking for, and now your question is what are we hoping to accomplish? You need to ask this because when people say we're on social media to reach millennials, and I ask why, that why question is really hard for a lot of people to answer. What do you hope to achieve? What are you going to be driving towards? What's the point? Usually this question should relate directly to your mission statement 
or your vision statement because your social media is not siloed. It's not sectioned off from everything else your ministry is doing. It's a natural outflowing of your organization. And so that natural outflowing should le live and breathe your mission statement. It should be about who you are. So what do you hope to accomplish? And then ask yourself, does social media have the potential and the capacity to accomplish this? There was one client recently who wanted to use social media to raise $600,000 in three months. They were a startup with no donors, no one on their social media channels. That, that's not, social media was not the solution for them. You had to use a different strategy. I've had churches who really want to have um, deep and meaningful personal prayer requests shared through Twitter so people can engage. And Twitter can be great for prayer chains, but people really don't want to share their most personal intimate thoughts on Twitter because it's very, very public and it's very permanent. And so it's not working. So do they need a different platform or do they need to rethink what they were hoping to accomplish? These are questions you ask. Who's my tribe? What do they need? What am I all about? What am I hoping is going to happen? And can social media meet this need? So if you were doing this with a new member, now a new member for your tribe would have to be more specific. What kind of new member? Which group are they joining? Which part of your tribes? But common values, opinions, and belief, usually new members are looking for new and less information than others in the community. Good. They're looking for new information is what one part of what they're looking for. They want to know, what do I do if I'm new to your community? So in the church context, when I go on social media, I want to know, when are your service times? Where are you located? Do you have small groups? How many services do you have? What are you about? I'm new. And I also, ah, don't want to have less information than others in your community. I don't want to feel like the outsider. If I join your social media group and suddenly feel like, ooh, everyone's going to know that I'm the new person. It's just like walking into a business or an event or ministry and feeling completely outsider. So you don't want them to have less information than other people. How do you foster? That's generally a value of new people. They want information. They don't want to feel as outside. And then what information is most meaningful? Usually how to connect ways to plug in, introduction into the community. If they're new, you know there's a knowledge deficit and they're looking for something. People are new for a reason. Why are they there? What do they need? What's your long-term goal? Typically, again, your new members, if you're putting them in donors or influ influencers, you'd be able to get more specific, but typically your goal is to develop longer and deeper relationships. When you have someone who's new, that's your end goal, right? You don't want them just to walk away. And social media does fit this need because it is an information base. People tend to use it and they use it to connect. So for new people who are looking for information and connection, social media can be a powerful outlet. What, I'll just leave this up here. For your tribe, identify one tribe that you have and answer these questions. Go ahead and you can either share with the person next to you if you want or you can just take notes. But my goal is that you can walk away with at least some concrete plan to build a stronger conversation on your social media. So do you have a tribe that you are trying to reach? If, you, if they're already up and talking, that's awesome. Use a different one. Use one that you're feeling like, hmm, could we build conversation? Could we make this stronger? Is there a way to engage? It doesn't have to be new members. It can be any tribe. And ask yourself these four questions. What makes that tribe a tribe? What information do they need from us? What's your long-term goal? Why do you care about this tribe? How does that relate to your mission? And then does social media fit this need? Ask those four questions and go ahead and either share with the person next to you or just take a note. We're going to drop back in. This is actually a really long conversation. Even trying to do just one tribe takes quite a bit of time. So if you have not identified your tribes on social media before, if that hasn't been part of your overall social media plan, I would recommend sitting down with your team because oftentimes, even if I think of all my tribes just personally, when I talk to the people on my team for my ministry or my church, more tribes will be identified, more groups. So you should make a list and be able to answer these questions for each because it's going to go into eventually when you make a content strategy calendar. How are you going to communicate with all of these tribes in meaningful ways in a way that doesn't look like you're schizophrenic on social media? You want to have a plan, but first you have to know your tribes. Yes. Um. What do you recommend, like, if an organization wants to reach five tribes? You know, what what's that maximum limit? Where do you, when do you start to just get relevant to everyone? Right? Because if I follow someone, yeah. 
and they start to cater to too many other tribes, then I might not be as engaged. Yeah, that's a really great question. So how many tribes are too many tribes? What I would go back to is, who are the tribes first? I'd try to see if there's any general groups that you could link together. So maybe some of them actually relate a lot closer, and you could sometimes customize very specifically, but they're actually one larger tribe. So I'd do that first. And then I would go back to the mission statement and ask, who are the most important tribes to make this mission statement happen? And those are going to be the ones we look at the most. Maybe every now and then we'll go after a different tribe, but because those are people, those are the ones I'm going to engage with. And typically, you would have maybe three to five. But the thing is, you might find some of your tribes, maybe your tribe on Facebook is one tribe. Maybe you don't have multiple. So you can cater to that tribe on Facebook. On Instagram, perhaps you have two or three. So you might want to ask which ones are the most important so that I can have a unified. So it goes a little deeper once you identify your tribes, figuring out which platforms they're engaging on and how you want to utilize that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to share just a couple strategies, typical approaches to building conversations on social media that are being used across the board. And then I'm going to try to bring that into the ministry sphere to give just a few ideas that may be helpful to you. We'll see. So first is the hashtag. Hashtags are powerful. Hashtags should be your friend if you're building conversations. You want to know what a hashtag is, and that's generally just a way of categorizing content. You can create your own hashtag, or you can use someone else's hashtag. We have a hashtag for this conference. There's hashtags for churches. There's hashtags for topics. You want to look through hashtags and do your research. We talked at the beginning about what groups your tribe together. What are they interested in? Those interests could be hashtags. Hashtag theology. Hashtag engaging poverty. Hashtag evangelism. Those are general hashtags. So you might identify some that really work for your tribes. And then you might make some very specific, just for your people, so that they can use that hashtag and form their community. So you want to use hashtags. You want to utilize it across platforms. I would strongly recommend that you have some that are everywhere because you're trying to build a larger community. Just like there are multiple tribes, there's also one umbrella once they're part of your organization. And you might be able to build some conversations. So the hashtag for this conference I've used on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, even though they're not all places that we're in, I'm using it to build that engagement. So you might have hashtags you use everywhere. You want to weave it into live events. One of the things I think is powerful is when you have a tweet deck running somewhere where people can send in their questions or comments about something that's happening live. There are hesitations and pros both ways. Some people feel like it is atrocious to use it during an event. You're there in person. Why would you need to be on your phone? But it also gives the opportunity for connections you might not have realized. You will have some people who are less outgoing in your tribes. It's just the nature of how people are. They might feel comfortable engaging or asking a question on Twitter that they would never do in the room. I teach here in public relations, and it is always a beautiful, complicated puzzle trying to get a class to gel together and become the type of community where everyone's going to talk. And typically, you have like seven to 10 students who want to do all the talking, and three that you're just like, please, please talk. I promise nothing bad will happen. So you have this. When I use hashtags and things like that, those quiet people, they come out. I get to know them a little more. So consider using it for a live event. You can also use it to moderate questions. So sometimes, instead of having all the questions come in live, a moderator can be looking at it and say, this is a great point. Let's ask the person who's giving the radio interview or something like that. And you want to integrate it onto physical media. So if you have a bulletin, a newsletter, a thank you, things like that, you can have a hashtag. You can encourage people to share their stories, to join the conversation, to tweet their photos using a hashtag. Images are huge. Video is powerful as well, and we're going to talk about that. But your Facebook posts, your tweets, Instagram all the way, Snapchat, images are what's driving these. People share, engage, and talk about images much more. You can read all the stats. They're changing, and they're different based on the platform you're looking at. But the astronomical engagement that happens when you have an image versus not is profound. So I would do the majority of your content with an image. You can use any number of images. It could be a meme. People really enjoy humor. So can you find something humorous and share it? They really look for information, right? So what if you made an infographic? 
based on the ministry results for your organization. If you watch the Barna Group, they do a great job of doing these studies across the US and then compiling it into popular infographics that people just tend to share. Maybe you have a book that just came out from your ministry and you could do an infographic just summarizing it. Any number of things could be an image. You could do photos from an event. You could do a Bible verse. Whatever fits your ministry, your church, is the kind of image you would use. But once you have these images, they can be shared. They can be engaged with, and people are much more likely to do that. Video is really strategic to begin using. And if you're not familiar with all the ways you can do it, you can use a video that's six seconds for Vine hard for people, but still good. Or you could go all the way up to YouTube. I'd suggest not more than two minutes per video if you're really using it for social media content. Typically, minute videos are even better, but sometimes it's just hard to squeeze it down. But short is good. And what you're doing is giving people a chance to engage with you in a different way. You might do a behind the scene. Has anyone ever seen how your office operates on a day to day? Do you have someone's story you could highlight? You could do a day in the life of. You could do Q&A. So I've seen some organizations where they're getting a lot of questions from donors or a lot of questions from people about how to volunteer. And instead of just putting up a PDF with an answer, they'll do videos. Here's your question, here's a video response. And they can use it in a lot of different places. You might want to consider, though, just a caution, elements such as audio and lighting. Videos are really powerful, and they don't all have to be polished, I don't think. They can have this textured feel to them, but if people can't hear you, or if they hear the water fountain more than they hear you, or your shadow, those, those things are a little more distracting than they are helpful. So definitely take the time to at least review it, even if it's a short video. And you might have some other social media strategies. You could do live di digital engagement. So Twitter chats are pretty popular. There's a lot of industries that have Twitter chats where you just use the hashtag public relations industry pro, something like that. You'd want it shorter. That was made up on the spot and poorly done. But that hashtag is then used to have a conversation with people around the world. And I've loved the Twitter chats I've gotten to be part of because people, you have questions that you ask and everybody chimes in. What's your best way for staying up on your devotions? People are chiming in. What's the most important reason we should be engaging with poverty? People are chiming in. You could also do Twitter chats that are led by someone. It could be led by your CEO, your president, your pastor. People who want to have a chance to engage can. You want to think about content curating. Where's content that you can get that you can share? Are your community members creating content that you can share? Do you have content that can be repurposed? Do you share any exclusive information? Is there any reason for them to be on your social media sites, something that they don't get somewhere else? That's pretty important. You want to give them some reason, some value, and that goes back to who are they and what do they need from you? You could do resource delivery. So you might use this as a way to say, hey, here is the white paper we just produced about this issue. Here is the notes from the interview you just heard. And you also really, really, really want to highlight your community. Because social media is about those relationships, it's not just putting information out there. It's responding, it's posting, it's liking, it's asking if you can share a photo, it's encouraging your community to upload their photos. It's making sure that when people join your community, they realize it's a group, it's not you just using it as a free publicity platform. So we're gonna go into some basic ways you could use it for social media, for ministries, and then we're gonna have a good portion of time for Q&A. So one way you could use it, an easy, easy win, is key quotes or takeaways. If you're doing an interview, if you're having a live event, if you're doing a sermon, post up an image and put the quote. Now, you gotta be short with your quotes. It has to be an image people wanna share, but they could put that on Twitter. They might Instagram it, they might do something. I've actually, not that I will, but I hope to, and this will keep me accountable, do something like this in the fall with my classes. If I can do a key takeaway from each lecture and put it on an image, my students would be more likely to engage with it versus me being like, students, remember this point. No one's gonna like that. In fact, they're probably gonna unfriend me. So what you wanna think is, what's the main point of why these people engaged with us? Can I give them something that they would want to share? Because social media is about getting that information and being an information source as well. Your community wants to share. Your community wants to have those conversations. Give them a tool to do that. You also want to develop ministry hashtags. We talked about this a little bit. So this is RH Stories. And that's Rock Harbor, it stands for that church. You might come up with one that you could use. And it's not just a hashtag that can only apply to information you post. 
it has to be a hashtag your community members can get on board with. So RH stories could be used by anyone going on a short-term missions trip, anyone doing a life group, anyone hanging out with people from church. It's something that's usable. What hashtag could be unique and branded for your ministry? You also think about videos and think about where can we place these videos? Is there a place that we could shorten it and make it longer, give snapshots? This came up last night and I was really interested because within 12 minutes, they had 915 views, 58 likes, five comments, and 13 shares. That's pretty good for a video, 12 minutes, especially at that time of night, because I was trying to get some latest images to show you guys. And it goes to show this went in to talking about who compassion is, more what they do, right? It's, it's, not, it's not here's our mission statement, it's not here's why you should give, it's let me tell you a story. Let me introduce you to a person that you're connected with if you're part of our tribe. So what stories could you tell in video? Not just ways to get publicity, but why are people connected to your ministry? What's your ministry doing? What's the outworking of the mission that you have? And how do you bring that to life? In a six second video, in a minute video, how do you share that? You wanna also create content around your community. So this is an Instagram shot, and if you are familiar with Instagram, these photos all kind of update based on your most recent photos. So you wanna ask yourself, are we putting up photos that have text? But also, when someone comes to Instagram, do they see the community or do they see, this is our brand, here's our logo, love us. You want them to see, hey, we're about people. This is a live, vibrant, interactive, engaged community. And that can come from asking your followers if you can use their photos. There's a lot of groups that do this. When you see a great shot taken from something that relates to your ministry, you contact them and say, that was fabulous. Would you mind if we also post that on our outlet? Mm -hmm. That's a great way to make them feel seen, but also to highlight your community. And you might want to consider developing unique pieces for your audiences. So if you have new members, and we talked about the fact that new members, they're new, and they don't want to feel like they're on the outside, and they're generally looking for information about how to plug in, would you want to do some quick image that would give quick answers on a Saturday night for the times of your service, or quick ways to get involved if you're donating? You can also consider Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Now, your organization needs to have a page. But some of your tribes might do well with a group. Some of your tribes might want to have a different level of interaction where you can actually send them messages. They can post things that aren't public for everyone. Maybe you're doing a training series for leaders. Maybe you're engaging with those influencers. So LinkedIn, you can target people by their job titles. Maybe you're asking, there's a ministry that I was talking to that works with CEOs mainly. Maybe those people naturally would group on LinkedIn because LinkedIn's a platform about your job title and that group can be exclusive and they can have conversations. Maybe Facebook is a great place for your small group leaders to be able to post announcements and updates without feeling like, wow, everyone on my Facebook group or everyone on the ministry's Facebook page is gonna see this. I just really wanna plug in with my people. And you really wanna build conversation. So this does not work for everyone. All of these ideas have to be viewed through the lens of who are my tribes, what do they need, what are we about, and will this work? So there's no here's your one step trick to getting conversation. But you might consider some pre-made tweets in the bulletin or some other way for people. If you have fans who are really interested in engaging and you want them to participate, maybe you say, hey, after the sermon, here's some key thoughts we had and you can just use it if you want. Could work, it could not. Place an image for the week in the announcement slide. So a lot of churches and ministries, you have announcement slides before events. You might want to use an image that they're going to then also see on Instagram and could share. Or you could use a Vine. Last night I was reading all the technology that is changing the wedding industry and they've gone from photo booths to GIF booths. booths. So you get there and you can have all these GIFs that are made and you can just post them like a Vine. Encourage the community to interact. That's the main goal, you guys encourage your community to interact. If giving them pre-made tweets does not work for your community, then don't do it. If it does, awesome, capitalize on that. If reaching out to them and asking them if you can use their photos freaks them out because they feel like you're stalking them, then don't do it. If it makes them feel like, wow, you really care about me, then do it. But whatever you do, reject the poll to use social media as a publicity platform. It's always so hard for me when I get asked, hey, can you post this about this event and this about this event and tell people about this happening? Because that's not 
social media. It can be a small part of it, but your communities are there for a relationship with two-way conversation around topics that are mutually interesting. People aren't mutually interested in a bunch of announcements. You also want to think about engaging videos. So later today, you're going to hear about how to make videos. But some of the things you might include, could you do a midweek reflection from your pastor? Could you do a ministry update from the field or at events? Just quick snapshots. I was looking at Mashable, if you guys follow them at all. They were at a huge social media event. And they just were sharing some quick videos from standing in line and talking to all the people who are also at this event. It was strangely fascinating. The story of those in the community. Can you tell someone who's a donor? Why are they a donor? Can you talk about the kid whose life has changed at VBS? Can you talk about the life of your ministry? Why do you exist? When people say, we don't know what to talk about that our community wants, that takes you back to square one. Who's your tribe? Why are they there? And what are you about? Those are the videos you should share. Tell a story, engage a conversation. You do want to keep it short. And again, visual resources. So I've heard people say, we don't have enough information to make visual resources. You totally have enough information. We all have enough information. The goal of visuals is to make a lot of information simple or memes to create funny things or share quotes. There's any number of ways you can use visuals. And if you're not very visually driven, I'm not. I use PictoChart. They have pre-made infographics that I can just replace all the pieces with, which is good for me because I don't have the time to try to uniquely create one each time. But you can use visual resources, and you will be surprised at how often they are used and reused and reused by people. So at this point, this is not the focus. The point point of today is how do you get conversations? But one of the first questions I'm usually asked is how in the world do you expect us to do any of this? I use Hootsuite. There's a free and paid version. And that helps me with my monitoring, particularly with hashtags and programming some information to go out. So it is a platform designed to help you manage social media. They have free and paid ones. Every individual platform, you can also set alerts and push notifications. So maybe you're on Instagram. You can identify who the main people are that you're interested in following and make sure it updates you if they post anything. So you can see what they've done. You can look into your Facebook insights and see, hey, which posts does our community engage with? And who is it actually that they're engaging with? Is it the females? It's the males? Is it this part of the country? You could use any number of these other ones. I tried to put up a whole bunch just because the point is that there are resources out there to make your life easier. It is not to get sucked into doing a ton. But you have the ability to monitor social media to see when these conversations are happening. Don't be part of that 70% that never responds, that just uses social media as a way to put information out there. Be the 40% that engages. Be the 40% that builds the conversation. Be the 40% that truly understands what social media is about, that two-way, unscripted, fluid conversation. So before we open it up for q and I want to talk about your unique flavor. These are general strategies, and that's what happens in a time like this. But you are different than any other ministry and any other church out there. You have something special, and you should figure out what that is because that is what infuses life into your social media community. Knowing who you are gives the space to identify the conversations you want to have. It gives the space to identify the strategies. So we're going to talk about your audience, your source, and your channel. Some key areas to know when identifying your unique flavor. You've talked about tribes. We've talked about general ways to engage them. Who are you? So your audience. Who are your specific publics you hope to reach? We've identified that. Are those publics active on the general platforms you are currently using? So maybe you found out that your tribes aren't active on your platforms. You need to rethink your platforms or your tribes. What are the values, needs, beliefs, behaviors of the audience? That was a question you had to identify for your tribe, because otherwise you won't know what they're looking for. And then what do you hope this audience will do as a result? Is it likely that that could happen through social media? These are the questions to ask about your audience. We did that together when we talked about your tribes. The next is to understand the source. And this is where it gets tricky. I've worked with a lot of ministries, and this this can make or break things. So who is the source for your organization? Do you have one main presence, or do you have multiple? So one organization I wi was helping, they had, I think it was the president of the organization, had a public social media presence. They had the national organization, and they had local chapters of the organization, and they had countries of the organization all online using pretty similar handles and content. 
that became a little confusing to identify who was where and how we were doing it. So that became more complicated as we identified who are your tribes, who are the tribes that are relating to all of these platforms. So you need to know your source, and that's not just one person. Do you have an individual who is publicly representing your organization, brand, ministry, or church? If so, that has to be considered when you're identifying your tribes and how to interact with them. And then how do all of these come together to form a unified conversation? Because you can't have multiple sources and then have them not relating with each other. That looks very segmented. So this is a complicated thing, something that we could spend a whole day talking about, but it's a question for you to ask. Do your sources have different tribes they're serving? Is that why you have multiple sources? Do your sources compete with each other, trying to get engagement from the same tribes? Is that part of the problem? Can people easily understand who these sources are and why they're different. And then channel. Not all platforms are created equal and there's no reason you need to be on every single channel out there. There's this misconception that just because it exists you need to get on it and that's not true. You need to figure out who your tribes are, what you're about, and which channels serve that need. So is it the best channel for you to be using to deliver the kind of information? I mentioned Twitter. They were trying to use it for really personal prayer requests. Not really the best channel. You could do a private Facebook group if you really wanted to, and there's been some success with that. You could have a group of major CEOs interacting, but Facebook honestly isn't the best place for them to interact as a CEO. That's not how they would interact. LinkedIn would make more sense. So ask yourself, is the channel appropriate for my tribe and the reason I'm using it, and what we're about as a ministry. Are there platforms that you just need to close down? Or platforms that you need to create? And then carefully evaluate the analytics. Throughout your entire social media time, you need to be looking and figuring out, did this work? When I started today, I mentioned that I was illustrating what happens in here should happen in social media. And we started with those conversations, and it kicked off really well. And then I tried it again to see if the conversation would still work. And then I suggested, hey, you could either write this personally or you could talk to the person next to you. And the room was almost silent. I learned a lot about you through trial and error. It's natural. It's how we learn to interact with people. You will learn a lot about your tribes through trial and error by looking at your analytics. You need to know, we think this is working. Is it actually happening? I can pull off any number of statistics from social media and hand it to you and say, here's the statistics for ministry. That doesn't mean that's how your tribe is going to behave. That doesn't mean it fits you. You can only figure that out by measuring it. This, to close, should be a part of your social media plan. I am a fierce advocate for making sure you have a social media plan. It is quite a robust process, and this is a snapshot. But you want to know what your goal is. Your goal should relate to your ministry's goal, not just be the separate thing out in social media, because that goal is the guiding reason for anything you do with your ministry. It guides who you hire, what initiatives you take on, why you invest some money here and not there. So your goal has to still guide your social media process. Then you identify your audiences and you really want to be as specific as possible. Because if you're not super specific with your audiences, it becomes hard to figure out who are they and what do they need and how do I interact with them. You want to create SMART, which is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goals. And you do, or objectives, and you do that because now you can measure. Now you can say, if this is the audience we wanted to see and we were hoping that this would happen, did it happen or did it not? And how do we know if we were successful? At the end of the day, we want to be really good stewards with what we've been entrusted. And if you do not measure on social media, it's very difficult to be a steward over what you have. Then you develop strategies and tactics to support those objectives. You can't just jump into social media and start using memes because they're funny. It could seem like a good way to go, but you've skipped your first three steps, and therefore you will not have the driving strategy behind what you're doing. And all along the way, you evaluate your social media. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.